Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar on the economics of soil health systems on Indiana farms. My name is Byron Rath and I serve as the Soil Health Institute Sustainability Specialist. Soil Health Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit and our mission is to enhance and protect the vitality and productivity of soil through scientific research and advancement. Today's webinar is the fifth in a series of nine state-based webinars on the economics of soil health systems. And this research aims to address the most frequent question that we receive from farmers, landowners, and their advisors. And that is, what are the economics of adopting soil health practices and systems? To answer this question and address this knowledge gap, we interviewed 100 farmers across nine states with the support of Cargill. And today we'll be sharing the results from 16 farms that we assessed in Indiana. In June, we'll be releasing an aggregated fact sheet of all 100 farms that were assessed. This project was not designed to be a random sample of all farmers and their economics, nor was it designed to understand the economics of transition, though we recognize that this is a knowledge gap that we need to address. Instead, this project was designed to intentionally interview farmers who've successfully been implementing soil health systems for five or more years so that we can understand the economics of those systems as compared to their conventional counterparts. Tomorrow, you'll receive a recording of this webinar and the fact sheet for the 16 farms assessed in Indiana. And that information can also be found on the Soil Health Institute's website at soilhealthinstitute.org forward slash economics. During the presentation, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and our speakers will address those questions in the last 15 minutes. So with that, I would like to offer thanks to Cargill for their support of this work and a sincere thanks to the 16 farmers in Indiana and the 84 farmers in the other eight states who agreed to be interviewed as part of this research. Without Cargill's support and the participation of those farmers, this research and these results would not be possible. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ryan Ciroli, Global Row Crop Sustainability Director at Cargill, who'll be offering opening remarks, and we'll introduce Dr. John Shanahan and Dr. Archie Flanders. Thanks, Byron. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to join the webinar today. Um, on behalf of Cargill, um, I want to offer a sincere thanks uh, as well to all of the growers who so willingly offer to share their insights and experiences to bring this study to life. Without their openness, this work would not be possible. I'd also really like to thank um, Soil Health Institute uh, for their leadership and their incredible knowledge to help us better understand the economic benefits of adopting soil health management systems. I do believe this work is, is, is a critical question uh, that we need to better understand as we look at, at how to scale soil health management systems. Um, I'd like to ask you as attendees to submit your questions for the panel uh, using the chat feature and that uh, as registrants, you will receive the fact sheet after the webinar concludes uh, and a link to the webinar recordings will be available on Friday. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Shanahan, uh, who is an agronomist and manager of the Economic Assessment of Soil Health Project uh, for the Soil Health Institute. John's career in the agronomy field has spanned both public and private sector roles uh, including positions at Colorado State University, uh, USDA's ARS, and more recently with Corteva. He has focused much of his efforts on developing and promoting the adoption of uh, more sustainable crop production practices, including soil health and nutrient management solutions. I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Archie Flanders, uh, an agricultural economist with the Soil Health Institute, and Dr. Flanders will join John uh, for the Q&A to answer any questions. So with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to uh, Dr. Shanahan. Well, thanks, Ryan, for that introduction. And also, I just want to say a special thanks to Cargill for pro providing the critical support we needed to carry out this project. And I'd also like to express our sincere appreciation to all the farmers who participated in this project and shared their experiences with Archie and I. Archie and I believe this project can go a long ways towards providing more farmers with the information they need when providing when adopting cell health practices. <clears throat> so today, Archie and I are extremely excited to share the results of this project involving the, the economic assessment of soil health systems in Indiana. And we've been hosting these uh, webinars on a state by state basis because we recognize that farmers prefer local information when it comes to making management decisions such as critical decision of adopting cell health practices. And a little bit more about the background of why we conducted this project so we, we've recognized for some time now that soil health practices such as no-till and cover cropping provide numerous environmental, benef environmental benefits, including storing soil carbon, 
reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving water quality, for example. <clears throat> and we've also known that these same practices can help farmers reduce erosion on their farms, build drought resilience into their production systems, increase nutrient availability, and suppress crop disease is just a few of the examples that we've seen and observed previously. However, when, far, when we talk to farmers about this decision, they tell us that, that it's a business decision and that there's an information gap around concerning uh, the profitability of adopting these practices. So again, our objective in conducting this research was to provide the farmers with this information that they need when adopting, when they're considering adopting soil conservation practice systems. So our approach in this study is we interviewed 16 farmers in Indiana who had adopted soil health practices for a minimum of, of five years. And our reason and justification for the selection criteria is it was thought that when we are interviewing these growers, we were interested in talking to growers who had been some ways into the journey of, the, of this uh, soil health adoption practice, because oftentimes what we've seen in research, for example, is that these practices don't always yield benefits until you, they've been, in this, been adopted for some amount of time. So the, again, that's the justification for, for selecting this, this group of farmers. We also, um, so based on the, we conducted it, uh, the interview lasted about one, one and a half hours to two hours. And we acquired the information that we needed to calculate partial budgets benefits. And these are costs before and after the adoption of soil health practices. And I'll just refer you to our website where you can, can find the, the more detailed methodology associated with, with this interview process. <clears throat> so again, only the differences between management systems are included in our partial budget analysis. In other words, what were, what were, we asked growers, what were they doing before they adopted soil health practices in their conventional practice? And then what were they doing now that they had adopted these, these practices? And then recognizing, of course, that market prices fluctuate, we calculate the revenue from the cash crops on this operation using standardized set of long-term average prices. And again, that's, that reference material is provided in our fact sheet. <clears throat> We did not include USDA payments into our partial budget analysis, although many of the farmers mentioned that they had used some of those payments to help them offset some of those upfront costs initially. However, many of these growers had been, had been somewhere down the road in the journey and were no longer receiving these payments. So, so we did not include those in, in, in the analysis. So it was mentioned, however, that this was very important as farmers learn how to to uh, adopt these practices and some of the challenges that they, they met initially when adopting these practices. So a little bit about where the locate. So uh, the map on the left represents the location of the 16 growers that we interviewed in, in, in Indiana. And you'll notice it's pr fairly well distributed across the state of, of Indiana and incorporates a lot of the, the uh, climatic conditions and, and soils that are represented in the state of Indiana. <clears throat> I'll also quickly call your attention to the the acres devoted to corn and soybeans. And you can see it's, it's relatively evenly distributed between corn and soybeans. And of course, that, what that suggests is that the farmers were all using the corn soybean rotation as a critical component of their soil health management system. The other thing I just want to quickly call your attention to is that the acres devoted to wheat production in these farms. Uh, on average, th these 16 growers grew on average around 116 acres of uh, of winter wheat, and that's important to, to mention because uh, introducing other crops crops into the rotation helps diversify the crop rotation is considered a part of a soil health management system. Also, I'd really like to call your attention to the size of these operations. When you total up these average acres of corn, soybean, and wheat, what you'll notice is that there was just, these operations were of significant size, much greater than, than the US average. And, I think that's important to point out is because um, it's, it indicates that, the, that these soil health practices like adoption of no-till and cover cropping can, can be implemented on some rather large operations. <clears throat> so the, this next slide represents the, the que a question that we asked the growers is, what, in what percent of your acres had you adopted a soil health practice such as no-till? And you'll see here, the, of the the average uh, percent of acres that these growers had adopted no-till on was over eight, around 88% of, the, of their crop acre, cropland acres where they had implemented 
no-till. <clears throat> that compares with the USDA survey statistics that acquired back in 2017 of 41% for the state of Indiana and 37% for national average. So you can see these growers were uh, had implemented uh, and devoted significant number of acres um, to no-till practice. And those growers who hadn't, hadn't adopted no-till practices, for example, had adopted some form of reduced tillage. And that was, that was the balance of their acres where they were using, for example, uh, things like, like uh, strip till. And oftentimes it was mentioned strip till was used to help growers deal with the cool, wet soil conditions that, that are encountered in Indiana during the spring of the year. And, and, and it allowed them to get, achieve much uh, more uniform corn stands under these challenging conditions. Likewise, when you look at the adoption of percent of acres planted to cover cropping with these 16 farmers, it was at 79% of those crop, cropped acres that had they devoted to cover cropping. So again, that, that adoption rate is considerably higher than what's adopted in, uh, at, at the state uh, for the crop plant acres in, in Indiana. <clears throat> and if you look at the national average of 5% white. So clearly these farmers were, were well ahead of their peers and having adopted things like like no-till and cover cropping. So this next slide then represents our, the, uh, the average partial budget analysis for these 16 growers now. So this is a very uh, busy table. It's packed with a lot of information. <clears throat> so what I wanna do is spend just a little bit of time unpacking that information to explain to you some of the details uh, of this table. <clears throat> so the table is broken into two halves and on the left half is a our partial budget analysis for our corn crop, cash, corn cash crop. And on the right hand of the table is the partial budget analysis for the soybean crop. So the way the table is broken down then, further divided is you'll notice that the, it's, it's color coded into a column associated with benefits, associated with reduced expenses, associated with adopting soil health practice. So that's, that's notated with the green color. And then on the right side of this column here is the, the additional costs associated with adopting soil health practices. And you can see the same sort of a scenario for uh, the corn, the soybean uh, expenses. And so what I'll do now is very quickly just kind of call your attention to some, some uh, specific items in the table. For example, <clears throat> what the growers told us in terms of when we asked them questions about the savings of fertilizer and amendments, you'll notice that the, that this this cost is considerably less having adopted a soil health practice. So for example, uh, on, for corn production, the expenses associated with the fertilizer expenses was, was considerably less than the additional cost. So that, that's, that identifies the cost reduction associated with fertilizer amendments. Likewise, when growers were adopting things like no-till, they, they saw a reduction in the amount of fuel that they consumed, as you can imagine. <clears throat> when the farmers are practicing less tillage on their, on their farm, why they're obviously gonna be consuming less, less fuel in the operation. <clears throat> Likewise, um, if you look at the, this line item here associated with equipment ownership, again, if a grower is, is practicing, uh, is using no-till in their operation, they will likely to have a reduced ownership costs associated with equipment. So when you sum up the, uh, the this column here representing the, the reduced expenses associated with adoption of soil health practices and compare that and subtract off the additional costs associated with adopting these soil health practices, you'll notice that there's a difference of about uh, a little over $20 an acre. <clears throat> and likewise, you'll see a similar comparison when, uh, when you sum up the reduced expenses and, and subtract off the additional expenses for adoption of soil health practices in the, in the soybean crop. You'll notice that's about a little over $15 an acre. So, uh, even, so if you consider, even if a grower had not realized a, a yield increase associated with these practices, they, they, were, they were seeing a reduction in costs associated with producing both corn and soybeans. Um, then we also asked the growers um, the question, did you, did you see any yield increases associated with adopting things like no-till and cover cropping? And we, we asked that question of all 16 of the growers and what they reported back to us is that on average, they, they, uh, they saw or reported to us a 10, 10 bushel per acre increase in adopting soil health practices. 
Likewise, for when we asked the question of them for soybean production, what they what they reported to us is that they saw around an average of three bushels increase in in, um, in yield associated with adopting soil health practices. So then, when you multiply the uh, the yield increase that they reported to us times the average price received, you'll notice you'll notice that the increase in revenue, the average increase in revenue associated with with the adoption of the soil health practices uh, with these 16 growers was, was around $43 an acre. <clears throat> Similarly, for, for a soybean uh, cash crop, with, when they reported, when we multiply the average price received times the yield increase at the average yield increase that they observed, what, <clears throat> that, that amounts to around a $30 per acre uh, increase in, in revenue change. So again, when, you, when we sum up all these benefits and costs uh, and subtract that difference, it's $115 an acre total benefits minus, minus the total costs associated with these adopting these old practices. It's, it's around $63 an acre increase in net farm income associated with adopting these old health practices. Similarly for soybean, the, the, uh, the average increase in net farm income reported to us for these 16 growers was around $47 an acre for soybean production. So recognizing that not all farms behave the same, we also wanted to report to you the change in net farm income across these, um, these 16 growers. And what you'll notice is that there, uh, the, that 13 of those 16 growers um, had seen a yield, had seen an increase in net farm income. Uh, and some of these growers had, had experienced some rather significant increases in net farm income. Three of those growers had actually reported slight decline in net farm income associated with these practices. And we can perhaps get into that a little bit later in, in the Q&A uh, session regarding those differences. <clears throat> Likewise for soybean, uh, 14 of the, or 12 of the uh, 16 growers in this case reported an increase in net farm income. So it's a, nice, it's a distribution that we might expect from, from a, a sample size of this size uh, in terms of changes in, in net farm income. <clears throat> So also we asked the question, um, what other benefits did you see besides these, these economic benefits associated with adopting these practices? And of course, we already talked about 75% of these growers indicated that they had, had seen a yield increase associated with the practice. Well over 90% of those growers indicated that they had reduced their fertilizer costs associated with these practices. All of the growers that we talked to indicated that, that they perceive their cropping systems to be much more resilient, having adopted things like no-till and cover cropping. They all mentioned, many of them mentioned that they were able to uh, access the field, for example, after a significant rain event, were able to get back to the field much quicker in their, in their fields where they had practices such as no-till and cover cropping compared to a conventional field. Many of the growers that we talked to mentioned that they had some, some benefit associated with these practices when they were negotiating land leases, for example. Landlords, tend, some of these landlords preferred growers who had been using these practices. We asked them the question about water quality. <clears throat> what did you see, what was your perception of water quality? Um, most of the growers reported to us that when, when they were observing these fields after a significant rain event, for example, the, um, what they saw was a much cleaner runoff from the fields. Uh, some of the growers we talked to uh, in the, some of the other states mentioned that they had actually measured uh, reductions in, in nitrate runoff or phosphorus runoff from the fields. So we didn't we didn't get much feedback from the, the Indiana growers, but 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 their their observation was that the water runoff from the fields was cleaner, less sediment in the in the runoff. <clears throat> what they believed is that these all these practices collectively were going to provide them and protect their license to operate going into the future. And then we also asked them the, the question, did you, have you been measuring changes in soil organic matter over time <clears throat> with the adoption of these practices? And, and some of those growers indicated, yes, in fact, that we had seen an increase in, in soil organic matter values over, over a period of eight to nine years. So around maybe 1% was, was some of the reported values. <clears throat> so I'll just kind of summarize here the some of the significant findings. I just I just want to again emphasize the size of these operations. These are rather significant size operations. And 88% of the acres on these operations, no-till had been uh, devoted to. 
79 percent of those acres in those in those 16 operations cover crops had been applied on so again these practices can be can be adopted on on sizable operations the uh, the soil health practices reduce the cost of production for corn around 25 dollars an acre they reduce the cost of production for soybeans around 18 dollars an acre so again even the, even if a yield increase is not observed, the cost and reduction of, of producing these crops was, was significant. These, when we sum up the costs and benefits uh, and the revenue changes, the, uh, the soil health practices on average increased uh, net farm income around $63 an acre for corn and around $47 an acre for soybean. So if we look at the current adoption rates of only 41% of no-till in Indiana and 8% of cover cropping, what it, would, it would seem that more Indiana farmers would be able to increase the, their net farm income ha, having adopted things like soil health practices. So that, that's uh, my last slide. Um, and I'll just again mention that as Myron, Byron mentioned earlier, you can find this, if you're interested in more detail, you can find this fact sheet uh, on our website. And I'll, I'll close by saying thank you for, for your attention. And Byron, I guess we'll open it up for questions. All right, thank you very much, John. Um, Yes, if you have questions for those attendees who are on the webinar, please enter those at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, Archie has answered a couple. I didn't know if you'd like to expand on these, John. One, um, I guess just to make sure that everybody has seen this answer, Andrew Greenlee had asked about the net income chart um, and if that was a producer who had switched to organic and Archie had responded that none of the growers in Indiana had reported anything to do with organic right. uh, production. That's cool. Um, yeah. And then Tony asked a question also that Archie had addressed. Um, but John, would you like to expand on this? Tony's question is partial budget. Where does cover crop seed establishment and termination fit? And Archie had responded that they were components of the seed expense, the equipment ownership, right. fuel, labor, and pesticides. So I think that that answered that question. Um, seeing no other questions from the group. Oh, here we go. Matthew asks, do you have insight into the independent impact of no-till compared to cover crops in terms of reduced production costs and or improved yield? So that's a great question. Um, we, we are not trying to answer that question in these state-by-state -state reports because we don't feel like we have enough uh, information an individual state basis to answer that question. So it is one of our, our considerations as we, do, as we develop that final report, Byron, is to, is to try to tease apart those differences. Great, and Matthew, just to, um, to add to John's uh, response, that report will be an aggregated report of the results from all 100 farms that we will be releasing in June. So stay tuned for that. Okay, well, Seeing no other questions, um, if if you do have a question that was um, that 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 comes up comes to you in the um, today or tomorrow or in next week, please do reach out to us at info at soilhealthinstitute.org. Um, a fact sheet uh, showing this information can be found on the institute's website, www.soilhealthinstitute.org forward slash economics. Um, all right, here we go. Courtney asks John. How do these results of savings compare to other states? Do you have that information as to how they might compare to the other states that were included in the study? Right, um, we have that information. Um, I mean, there's some variation from state to state in terms of costs and benefits and increase in net revenue. Um, I, and again, we'll, we'll provide that. So Indiana, um, I think was probably on the upper end of the, these, these, these changes in net farm income, there were some some of the states on average that saw a little bit less in terms of that increase in that farm income. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're, we're working on aggregating that information as we speak. And so it's, uh, it's gonna be really interesting. I'm, I'm really excited when we get, get all this information pulled together. Yeah, so again, Courtney, I think that that will be, that, that question will be answered um, and addressed in the, in the final fact sheet. Is that what I'm understanding, John? Yeah, I mean, Archie might have something to add there. I didn't know. Uh, it, it'll, it'll be in the final. Rather than try to recite something from memory, I think we should just wait till we put the final report together. Yeah. And does that also, John, will that, that final report include comparisons around results of increased yields? Yes. Yeah, we'll have, a, we'll have all that information detailed out. Uh, 
across the 100, 100 right. farmers. Dan Towery asks about the cover crops and planting green. Um, did you collect any information on the number of, of species, the diversity of those species and the timing? Mm -hmm. We, we did record all that information. Um, we, we didn't report that in this in this particular webinar just simply just kind of because we, we didn't have a, there's a lot of detail packed into all that information and so it wasn't reported it wasn't reported in the webinar. All right. Um, I see Wayne has come off mute. Wayne, if you have uh, yeah, would you like to respond to one of the questions? Yeah, yeah I is actually not not to that particular question, but a different one. I think the first question kind of about uh, the costs of cover crops and seed and termination and those things. Uh, one thing I think would be important to, for people to realize is like, for example, when they're looking at that uh, budget table there, table there, again, that is the average of all 16 uh, farms. And you may recall it was what something like 79%, I believe it was, that, uh, that were using uh, cover crops. And so that additional expense, for example, of $12.88, you know, for like most of that, I suspect was cover crop seed. Uh, that is a reflection of a being divided by 16, uh, not by the 12 or 13 or whatever it was uh, that was actually using them. So that's the way that all of these data had to be, you know, kind of normalized. So you could, we can compare um, inputs and, and costs. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to make sure that people realize that. So if they look at a number and say, hey, that looks a little bit low, remember there's only a, a percentage of these people that, uh, you know, that were using cover crops. Mm -hmm. Just want to make that point. Just, just to add to what Wayne said there, uh, our plan will be to, is to, to put, pull together the information on, on a per average basis of how, what the cover crop costs were, uh, not only the seed itself, but the, the seeding costs associated with, with establishing the cover crops. Great. Um, okay, another question, um, and perhaps um, John, if you could speak to this. Eric asks, you know, can you speak more broadly? And Wayne, you might also want to speak to this question. Can you speak more broadly about the types of economic barriers that farmers face um, when adopting soil health practices? Right. Um, well, I mean, of course, the the cover crop expense itself is is going to be an upfront cost that growers have to incur. And many of the growers that we talk to, they use some of those USDA payments to help offset, offset some of those, those costs when they were, particularly when they were just getting started in the journey. And, and it helped them uh, do some experimenting and kind of find out and, and kind, of, kind of figure out what the optimal seeding rates were, species mix and whatnot, so that they used those, those cost uh, subsidies to help them get started in the soil health practices. Yeah, and I guess I would just add in there that, uh, you know, I, I think that the lack of information on the economics of these soil health systems has been a primary barrier uh, for the adoption of these systems, which was the uh, intent of this study to really try to help address that gap and re help remove that barrier, recognizing that it's a big country, there's a lot of different crops, for example, you know, California has some 400 different kinds of crops, and, and so uh, we know that this is not the answer to everything. Uh, but we think this is a, a good start uh, and I wanted to acknowledge that there are other organizations also providing this type of uh, information. American mm -hmm. Farmland Trust has been conducting some, I think the Environmental Defense Fund has uh, in partnership with the Soil Partnership. Uh, let me see, I know NRCS does it. And so uh, there's a number of organizations that are really, really working uh, to address this barrier. Another aspect that I believe, you know, exists uh, regarding the, the economics of this is the um, what land ownership. Uh, if someone is leasing land, uh, then there's just kind of that uh, less propensity for investing in these long-term uh, benefits mm -hmm. because it can take a little time uh, to see uh, measurable benefit uh, in these investments in soil health. And so because such a large percent of uh, a lot of our agricultural land is leased, um, then there is that kind of that uh, that kind of inherent barrier there, I would say too. Mm. But uh, but again, I think a primary objective of this particular project was to address that information gap. Just for years and years, when we've been mm. we've known soil investing in soil health is really good for building drought resilience and 
uh, reducing the, uh, or enhancing, I should say, nutrient availability, reducing nutrient loss, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, increasing carbon sequestration. So they, all kinds of environmental and on-farm benefits, but we've always been hit up by that question about, well, what, what are the economics, you know, of these systems? And, you know, we recognize farmers are businessmen and women and they need to make a living at it. And so that was just a real driver here for uh, conducting this study. All right, I have another question. Um, I think building on that point, Wayne, and that there's an existing body of, of, of literature out there that we're contributing to and other organizations have contributed to as well. Vincent, colleague uh, from EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund asks, did any of the farmers discuss um, challenges or successes in working with their lenders to include conservation practice investments in their operating loans? Excellent question. Yeah. So we asked that question, you saw that in one of our survey questions. Um, so I don't think we, what I, and Archie can back up, can add here too, but I don't think we, we didn't hear a lot of growers say that they had seen too much benefit associated with the lender. I think they're, they're hoping to. Some of the growers that we talked to said that when they, when they talked to their banker, the banker would say, well, you're one of the more profitable operations in my portfolio. And so that was mentioned. Um, I, we did, I don't recall us hearing anybody say that they got, say, reduction in interest rates associated with, with these practices, because that, be, that could be a natural conclusion from this project. Well, these are less risky operations. And so you would think that they would be allowed maybe better access to credit in these operations. And so those are the kind of things I think that those are just other avenues that, that growers can use to, to, to work with and show benefits associated with these practices. Mm -hmm. Great, Gary asks, Wayne, did you wanna to speak to that lender question? Uh, no, I was gonna to speak to Gary's question there. Yeah, Gary asks, all right, to you, Wayne, does soil organic matter have anything to do with soil fertility reductions with corn and or soybeans? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a really insightful question. I don't believe this particular project was set up to, um, to answer that directly, uh, but I will say that uh, there's a lot of research, you know, literature that shows that increasing organic matter uh, also um, goes along with increasing nitrogen availability and in some cases also phosphorus availability because when you increase that organic matter, that carbon in the soil, uh, what is tied to it are things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And by enhancing that organic matter, you can create basically more biological or microbial activity in the soil. And so those micro microorganisms are feeding on the carbon. And when they feed on that carbon, then they're releasing things like nitrogen and phosphorus for the plants to take mm -hmm. up. So you do get an overall increase in the availability of those nutrients. But then there's that other side of it too that's also really beneficial is by um, enhancing that microbial activity, then you build the soil aggregates, you know, where the sand, silt, and clay particles bind together. And what that does is it helps the soil be more friable uh, less erosive, uh, but being more friable now helps uh, more uh, moisture, like heavy rain, things like that infiltrate into the soil, but it also allows the roots to penetrate the soil easier and essentially kind of exploit that soil for not just water, but for nutrients. Uh, and so those two things really kind of working in combination together with the greater nutrient availability from organic matter, but also the effect of the organic matter on creating a physical environment that benefits the ability of the plant roots to take up those nutrients can really both combine uh, to enhance a nutrient uptake. And we think that's one of the reasons why some of these people that are the farmers that are um, uh, using nutrient management, things like nitrogen management, uh, when they are um, using these soil health systems, uh, while they are able to uh, reduce their fertilizer applications. Excellent. Just to, um, add to, just to add to what Wayne said, we did, please. Wayne, we, as you probably remember, we did ask the question about whether, what are the 4R practices that they had adopted and a majority of these growers are very high level managers and all, almost all of them are using things like variable rate uh, fertilizer application, grid soil sampling, split applications of nitrogen fertilizer. So these were, these were top level managers in all aspects of crop production. All right, final two questions here, John, thank you. Um, if you. If you know what factors pre prevented some of the farmers from seeing increased profits, um, you know, of those that you, that you, that you sampled? 
Mm. Yeah, um, I'm not sure we'll have a good answer again. I think we're going to just need to dive into the, the 100, 100 uh, observations to kind of maybe see if there is some broad generalities that we can derive from the from that. Um, I mean, growers talked about things like, uh, uh, particularly in the more northern states, is getting cover crops seeded in, the, in short growing seasons and cool wet soils. And so those were some of the challenges that they mentioned uh, in terms of adopting some of these practices, um, but I think it'll it'll be better if we can kind of pull if all this information together, aggregate it, and then maybe we can get a little bit more robust uh, response to that question. Archie, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. No, that, that covers it, well. All right. So Matthew, be on the lookout for that um, that aggregated fact sheet in June as well, and I believe that will be a similar answer to Ben's question, which is what portion of the economic differences as a result of no-till adoption versus what portion can be attributed to cover crops? And so, John, I believe you answered that previously in yeah. saying that that'll be answered in that aggregated fact yeah. sheet to be released in June. Is that correct? Great. Yeah. All right. Well, I believe that covers all of the questions. Thank you to everyone, um, to the attendees that joined today, to the 16 farmers in Indiana who agreed to be interviewed, participate <coughs> in this project. As I'd mentioned previously, you'll receive a copy of this recording and, um, and the fact sheet um, tomorrow. That's also can be found on the Soil Health Institute's website at soilhealthinstitute.org forward slash economics. We'd also ask if you have a couple of minutes after today's webinar, just to please answer a short three minute survey, um, giving us helpful feedback so that we can improve future webinars. And with that, thank you everybody. Hope you have a great afternoon. <laughs>